cannot bear to see what has become of Japanese cartoons. Once strong and compelling, with great stories and personal vision, strong characters and mighty themes, now all gone. Only bug-eyed airheads and flash and dazzle left. Genericism everywhere. In the year 1979, American cartoons were facing annihilation. In the late 20th century, the mysterious country Japan, a country separated from ours by a vast ocean, began to export their dramatic tales of struggle and sacrifice. Domestic cartoons became intolerable. Kids could only survive by tuning into Japanese animation far above the standards of our own programming. At least, that's how it seemed to some of us. After all, what were you going to do? You're 10 years old. Everyone thinks you're an idiot. Even if you are an idiot, being treated like one sure as hell doesn't make the problem go away. But in the 1970s, children's programming wasn't exactly aimed at the intellectual. In fact, in America, animation in general had usually been regarded as disposable fluff for the kids, or Disney, which was pretty much the only thing that was taken seriously by anyone. Any other kind of animation had exactly one role, comedy. It could be good comedy by the likes of Chuck Jones or Tex Avery, or it could be this crap that we got all through the 70s. I mean, seriously, what was going on here? It was formulaic, generic, it was repetitive, and it all looked alike. Seriously, how many shaggy variants did one generation need? So when stuff started trickling over from Japan, it tended to get your attention. I mean, what was the alternative? Make it stop. So certain things started happening. For one, oh yeah, I know, this wasn't a cartoon, but this was basically a kids movie, but nevertheless grabbed the imaginations of lots of adults too, and including the imaginations of lots of marketing adults who decided to start churning out stuff like this. Now, never you mind the fact that the show this was originally based on, Science Ninja Team Gatchaman, had nothing to do with outer space at all. Enter Sandy Frank, whose name rolls up in Star Wars fashion at the beginning of this production. He decided to shove in a whole bunch of animation depicting outer space travel. And you know what's really mind-blowing? Every planet they go to has an environment exactly like Earth's. And human beings, just like us. And never you mind, the Japanese animation was kind of rough and raw and cool looking and had this neat stylistic bent to it, and the American animation looked like this, as if two guys had done it over the course of a weekend. This was going to jump on the Star Wars bandwagon. I mean, after all, we invented this totally new character who looked like R2-D2 and talked like C-3PO. Nevertheless, Motor! Tires! Jesse! Speed buggy! That's me! You kinda had to watch it. It still had something kinda cool to it. And then something else happened. I remember seeing the ads. The most exciting, most daring space adventure of all time! Star Blazer! Would it be as cool as Battle of the Planets, I remember thinking. And then, finally the first episode aired. We're outnumbered five to one. Radioactivity from the planet bombs has seeped deep into Earth. At that rate, in a year, Earth will be unlivable. We're going back together. It's just a simple matter of mathematics, sir. There are 470 men in your flagship. There are 20 in our ship. You're Alex's younger brother. Can't talk now, Captain. There's a bunch of gamelons coming at us. If he hadn't held the enemy back, we wouldn't have made it back to Earth. You left him behind. He chose this day. Wild Star! Good Lord! Battle of the Planets was kind of a distant memory at that point. Star Blazers, originally entitled Space Cruiser Yamato in Japan, for us would forever redefine what a cartoon could actually do. From the very beginning, it was really obvious this was like nothing we had ever seen before. 
Much like how I always imagine my mother must have felt trying to explain to later generations what it was like when the Beatles showed up, there was a sense that you really had to be there to see that something had seriously changed. It was really cinematic in a way we hadn't seen with animation outside of, yes, again, Disney. Animation produced for television simply didn't look like this. After years and years of a side-scrolling flat view of the world, we suddenly had this third dimension to explore. This had actual camera angles and lighting, dramatic audio effects. Notice how during when the captain's ship is being attacked here, you could actually hear the alarm warbling and failing in the background as the ship's power fluctuates. We're going home. Captain, are we retreating? We've done all we can. This is the sort of attention to detail you never got from Fang Face or any of the other junk that was being shoved at you at a 10-year-old age. I mean, why do people assume that kids want to see garbage? No respect! No respect! Kids will watch garbage if you put it in front of them. They're gonna watch whatever. Adults aren't really much better at that. But if you show people something of actual quality, they will gravitate towards it. Decepticons! Yes, yes, I know this was a huge hit last year. It doesn't count. It doesn't get to the exception. We're, we're just gonna pretend that never happened. What really set Star Blazers apart was the fact that it included actual drama. In the first episode, they set up what they describe as basically Earth's Last Stand. And when Earth's Last Stand is completely lost, Earth appears doomed, setting up the plot for the entire rest of the series. Come to Iskandar. When you get here, we will give you the Cosmo DNA. It is the only thing that can save you. For once, we had a story that actually continued episode to episode. Now, while this is very popular in American television now, there's no end of series that have season-long story arcs. At the time, it was unprecedented. In fact, the idea of the serialized story was something that used to be relegated to what were considered to be basically lesser forms of entertainment. Comic books, daytime soaps, the Saturday afternoon serial that had all disappeared by that time, except in homages like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Star Blazers brought that back with one important addition. It had the decency to give us an ending instead of a story that just kept going and going and never resolved. So while you could tune in to the Legion of Doom's latest attempt to take over the world via the evil ACDC logo or some such thing, you could conversely watch a show themed around something of real world significance like The Bomb. After all, Japan being the only country in the world to date that's ever actually had nuclear weapons deployed against it probably took this really seriously. But nevertheless, it really still resonated with American audiences, especially in the early 1980s when we were still struggling through the lingering vestiges of the Cold War. We've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The threat of mutually assured destruction was still a big fear in a lot of people's minds, and Star Blazers really brought this into sharp relief. Through flashbacks, we see our hero is originally a pacifist as a kid. He didn't want to know about the war, didn't want to hear about his brother's exploits fighting the Gamelons. Oh, I forgot. My little brother doesn't believe in fighting. Until this day happened. It was very much a pervasive fear amongst many people, including kids. And for once, we saw it treated intelligently. In Japan, the show was very much about the spirit of Japan rising up and overcoming in the aftermath. Originally, the ship was the World War II battleship Yamato, an actual battleship that was sunk near the end of World War II. It's resurrected, refitted into a spacecraft, and sent off for the mission. Now, for the American audiences, they did acknowledge the ship was originally the Yamato. Is that the Yamato? Of course, this blatant display of national pride wouldn't really be a point of identification for American audiences, so the name was changed to the Argo. This, of course, being a reference to the story of Jason and the Argonauts, the Greek legend about Jason going in search of the Golden Fleece. The symbolic naming convention continues with the captain, who's now called Captain Avatar. And long before everyone knew that Avatar meant that movie about those blue cat people, or the stupid little things we use in our live journals to denote who we are, Avatar actually meant a deity descended to Earth in human form to accomplish some mission, or the embodiment of a principle. This was an early sign that the people producing this show were actually thinking about what they were doing, unlike certain previous shows I could and have mentioned. Of course, one is likely to point out at this point that the hero was named Derek Wildstar, which, let's be honest, is a little on the goofy side. 
this goofiness goes, it's going a bit more this way. But it's not really that much goofier than, say, Luke Skywalker, and frankly is probably a lot less goofy than Luke Star Killer, the name Luke very nearly got stuck with. In fact, there's actually a lot of comparisons between these two, other than the perfectly normal first name, slightly silly last name. We have the Dead Family, Struggle Against Evil Galactic Empire, Pilot of a particularly spiny space fighter, White Bearded Mentor, Tendency to whine a little bit. It just isn't fair. It still doesn't start. Be quiet! It might almost prompt some people to call this a ripoff of Star Wars, especially considering other characters like this dome headed, utilitarian, flashy faced robot. Except for the fact that this show actually predates Star Wars by three years. <laughs> While we wouldn't see it in America until 1979, the show had premiered in Japan in 74. It had suffered in the ratings and not done particularly well until the worldwide success of Star Wars had producers on both sides of the Pacific scrambling to sate the public's newfound love for space opera. That was my son. Including some ways that doubtlessly looked pretty familiar to Yamato's Japanese producers. Yet despite its status as just a cartoon, Yamato had already done this story better than the more episodic Galactica, as it contained a better evocation of what is popularly known as the hero's journey. As the story begins, our hero has a rather adversarial relationship with his mentor, as epitomized by this issue. What makes you all think Captain Avatar's such a great man? Sure, he wins a lot, but look at the cost in lives. Of course, eventually he finds out his case is hardly unique. You're not the only one to lose someone you care for. This is a cruel war. Many families are destroyed. Captain Avatar lost his only son in that same battle on Pluto. Oh. He's a fine leader. He knows what must be done. And even if he has to pay a price, he does it. And he doesn't blame others. He just goes on. This issue ultimately becomes a bonding point between these two because they have the same problem. It's been a tough day for both of us. I, too, had no one to talk to on Earth. Of course, Captain Avatar has one other thing that he's keeping from the rest of the crew. He's dying. I checked the results of your physical test just before we left Earth. Even then, there were signs of radioactive poisons in your body, and Captain, your condition is getting worse. No, I cannot be hospitalized. Captain. I alone am responsible for this ship. The subject matter the show had to deal with was very frequently of a much more mature nature than you would expect to see on TV at all. Take this scene, at the very end of the first season. The captain's been sick for half the journey, and he and his doctor are discussing... Well, they never come out and say it, but the subtext is pretty obvious. Something to do with death. I dreamt of Earth last night, the way it was before the bombings, green and cool. That's a nice dream. And there was a fresh wind. And my wife standing at the window with my son. And even though the captain does actually survive until the very end of the journey, he's not the one calling the shots for a very great part of it. After all, the hero would be totally unnecessary if that more capable and experienced character was always around to make the hard decisions. I can no longer carry the full responsibility. You'll be deputy captain. But, Captain, I'm not qualified. I'm counting on you. I want you to know I'm counting on you. And in taking on the mantle of leadership, our hero, in a way, goes back to his roots, not as a pacifist exactly, but as someone who no longer craves war and conflict. I think this was our last battle, Nova. The Gamelons have finally stopped fighting. Of course, a hero is only as strong as the villain necessitates him to be, and in this way, Star Blazers really excels with one of the best-drawn villains ever. I don't mean literally well-drawn, because sometimes that wasn't true. But Leader Deslock stands as one of the best villain characters I've ever seen because he actually had a story arc, much like the heroes. His assessment of the Star Force goes from blithe dismissal... Let those two on Pluto stop the Star Force. ...to grudging respect. Gamelon has the greatest scientists in our galaxy, but sometimes simple solutions are the best, and I guess the barbarians know that. To actual respect. You missed the fun we had with him, Lysus, and now we better get serious. To outright hatred. The Star Force. <laughs> and finally, rather surprisingly, to full identification. You, all people, should understand it. A man who fights for his homeland fights on. That's what I've done. As long as I live and fight, then Gamelon lives. 
The second season primary villain, Prince Zordar, wasn't as complex as Leader Deathlock, but despite being a megalomaniac dictator, he did still also have his own personal motives, or rationalizations as one might call them. People want to be governed, they don't want to have to make decisions to use their judgment, it's too difficult, too demanding, they want things done for them, not by them. And if the universe is to run efficiently, who will do it? If you think kids won't notice the difference, you've got a very short memory. And all throughout, Star Blazers continued to surprise us with what it would do and the way it would twist the plot. With the rest of the Earth fleet destroyed, our heroes make a final stand against the Common Empire. The Earth's already surrendered, and there's nothing else to stop them. So they make this final, last, desperate battle, all by themselves, in the total defiance of the Surrender Order, in order to maintain Earth's freedom. And they lose! What other examples of this can we think of in popular fiction? They lose! They fight the valiant battle, and they go down in flames. And now, all I have to do is say goodbye to what has been my home for so long. And to you, who have been like a father to me. While things would ultimately turn out alright for the Earth in the end, nevertheless, this was a startlingly downbeat ending for an ostensible adventure show. Can one even imagine an ending like this on a season of He Man or the Trans Fuck? Not so you shut up! Go, I call, right? so, go, I go away! Shut up! Get out of my. What are we gonna do with this shrimp taco? You know, just bump a cap in his ass, throw him in the truck, and then nobody gonna know nothing, not me. Yeah. Of course, in coming across the sea, Star Blazers didn't arrive exactly in the form that it had been seen in Japan. There are numerous tweaks. In fact, the largest amount of editing simply had to do with cutting down the running time to 23 minutes to accommodate more commercials. However, there were certain things that were allowable for kid audiences in Japan that weren't quite as acceptable in America. Now, there has been a lot of misreporting regarding the amount of censorship that took place in the show. In fact, I've read many articles stating that all planes and spaceships blown up on screen were claimed to have been operated by robots, so there wouldn't be any death. In fact, this isn't even remotely true. Clearly, there's living beings in these ships and in these planes. No one ever tried to say they were operated by robots. In fact, the only time robots ever show up is in tank battles. There's a platoon of robot tanks coming over the hill. They look like robot tanks again. Why tanks, of all things, should be the magical exception is a mystery that haunts the show to this day. In fact, for a large part, Star Blazers didn't really have a problem with characters dying. And when they died, they stayed dead. You're all dead! Those were the super friend robot duplicates you attacked. Though they tended not to show the actual deaths, somebody getting incinerated in a ball of fire would usually get trimmed out. But you knew the character was gone. That said, at the same time, the amount and type of violence that got cut out of an episode could vary widely from show to show. In episode 5, they actually looped in earlier footage of this dogfight just so they wouldn't have to show Wildstar shooting down a single enemy plane even though he'd shot down a whole bunch of enemy planes in the episode just prior to this one. There tended, however, to be one general exception to when you were allowed to say somebody was dead. There were no suicides. If a character was going on a death mission, they had to tweak that around. That just wasn't allowable. So, for example, this character, who in the Japanese version came in attached to the bottom of the ship and self-destructed, is now said to just be planting an explosive on the bottom of the ship. And they actually rather cleverly ran the tape backwards to show him flying away from the Argo again, so that when the explosion went off, you could pretend it wasn't actually his own craft. After that, he retreats from the battle in disgrace. On the other hand, these two guys, they die. Unequivocally, they're slammed into a rock, they blow up. What they don't tell you is that they were planning a suicide attack before that happened. In the American version, it looks more just like they're moving in for another bombardment. And that's pretty much the pattern throughout the series. Except in this one case, a second season episode detailed the capture of a Comet Empire prisoner in his interrogation. He eventually escapes and goes back to his own fleet, but finds they won't let him land. They don't trust him anymore. They think perhaps he's been contaminated or coerced or turned somehow, and they won't allow him back on their own ships. So he returns to the Star Force. This is Deputy Captain Wildstar. You are welcome back aboard the Argo. We invite you to join us not as a prisoner, but as a fellow soldier. However, despite the shoddy treatment he's received at the hands of his own superiors, he still won't give up allegiance to his nation and takes the only way out he can. Now, the 
assuming this was allowed to stay in because there's simply no other way you could have edited the end of this episode to have it make the slightest bit of sense. Unfortunately, while this is also true for the, one of the most notorious examples of editing in the show, they went ahead and did it anyway. Throughout Season 2, we follow the secondary character of Sergeant Knox, who was rescued when his base is destroyed by the Comet Empire. He spends much of the rest of the season acting out, causing trouble, being insubordinate, and trying to cope with the fact that he left a lot of his friends back on the battlefield and doesn't feel very good about it. I wish I were drinking this with you, my friend. Goodbye. Building to this point, we will take on the most critical mission of the entire show. Look, you've got to let me do this. I never thanked you for rescuing me and my men on Brumus that time. It's hard for me to say things. He elects to stay behind to destroy the Common Empire's primary reactor. Go! I'll be all right. Get out of here, okay? Don't stand there. Get going! Now, come on. Just from the music alone, you know this man's not getting out alive. I'm sorry, but the soundtrack has the final say on what a scene is about, no matter what the characters are trying to tell you. Oh, he's an angel! He's an angel struck from heaven! Oh, so Clearly, that man is dead. And while I can't ever prove it, I'm convinced that this was the result of some last-minute decision being handed down by some killjoy higher-up decreeing... The word is no. 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 Disallowed. End of line. See, the boys on the board feel as though this is not in the best interests of our target audience, and they have therefore asked that this additional dialogue be inserted into the following scene. You may use this crowbar if necessary. We were worried when we didn't hear from you. Knox got out just behind you. Just behind you? Behind him where? What, back there somewhere? Oh yeah, there he is. Why does it look so bad that they just you know, replace his skin and organs, he should be right as rain. Let's be serious for a minute. No, wait, let's not. If they won't treat us like adults, why act like them? Right, Mr. Frog? That's right. I mean, really, what's going on here? What do they think they're doing? A plot line that's been developing throughout the entirety of the second season gets gutted at the last minute for what reason? Why? Because some nervous sensor was sitting around going, Oh no, what about the children? <laughs> Won't somebody please think of the children? You know what? Screw the damn children. The children will be fine. We all seen this happen just a couple of years before, but all survived. On top of that, unlike some of the other edits in Star Blazers, this wasn't even remotely well done. I mean, come on. He doesn't even get away from that bomb. They could have at least showed him run back across the bridge first, but no. It's this last minute tagged on dialogue that's not fooling anybody. One of the companies responsible for Star Blazers, Claster Productions, went on to produce G.I. Joe and the Tran- No, you know, I'm not even going to go into that one. G.I. Joe, one of the most notoriously sanitized depictions of warfare in all of animation, wherein no one ever died, and people in firefights couldn't aim straight to save their lives. Not that their lives ever needed saving, since the other guys couldn't shoot straight either. Star Blazers fortunately never went that route, and unfortunately Claster didn't seem to learn from the work they did in this production. I mean, as much as they did cut out, occasionally something like this would slip through. Oh, God, that's gonna hurt. Not the character, because he's not real. But the poor brain of the guy that had to sit there and make the decision that they were actually gonna have to leave that shot in, because, let's face it, this character has no leg for the rest of the show. How else were they gonna explain that? Hey, Sandor, where's your leg? Do you ever get tired of act O? Oh, it's gone. However, unlike almost any other dubbed animation property before or since, Star Blazers was unique in the fact that occasionally they would do things that were better than the Japanese version. For example, there's a lot more sound in the English version. There's places where they actually forgot to put sound in the Japanese episodes, and the English version compensated for this quite nicely. And check out the sound of the wave motion gun as it appears in the original version. It's actually really sort of underwhelming. Listen to what it sounds like in the American version. Now that sounds like something that's gonna seriously tear you a new one. 
They also made a really smart cut in Episode 6, when they land on Titan to replenish some supplies, and Gamelon tanks roll up and blow up their landing craft. Because at the end of the episode, they climb right back into that same landing craft and leave again. Star Blazers cut out the explosion, making their version of the episode make about a thousand times more sense. Not to mention the way they handled this twist ending at the end of the first season. By, for example, having it be a twist ending at all. The beginning of every episode, while showing us the planet Iskandar, the Star Force's destination, there's this other planet always sort of hanging off here in the side, which they never mention. I remember the hair standing up on the back of my head when they finally revealed what the other planet was. That's it. One is Iskandar and one is Gamelon. I'm sure of it. On the other hand, in Space Cruise Yamato, they totally give this away as early as the third episode. There's no surprise at all, whereas the American version totally puts you in the same shoes as the characters when they discover this. It's much more dramatically interesting. Here, though, the death of Captain Gideon. In the Japanese show, we actually see his ship crash and burn as it rams into the common empire. But in the American version, they actually went with something a bit more subtle. I know you can do it. Captain Avatar has taught you well. Good luck. Captain Gideon! Again, it puts the audience in the same shoes as the heroes, where you experience his death just as they do. And frankly, even though they don't show the ship blow up, it ends up making his death a lot more personal, because we actually hear him die as it happens. To this day, Star Blazer still stands as one of the best examples of Japanese animation in general, and one of the best adaptations ever produced for the English-speaking work. The actual dialogue translation was, for the most part, really spot on. And even if it was sanitized slightly for American audiences, it was so much better than anything else we had at the time, we really needed it. I mean, what else could you possibly ask for from the story? It had awesome designs, great characters, fantastic direction, and had an amazing and extensive soundtrack I've been playing throughout this video, comprised of around a hundred different musical tracks for its 52 episode run. It had this weapon that was so badass they couldn't even look at it while they were firing. Come on, what ten-year-old isn't gonna go for that? My eyes, the goggles do nothing! And after that, things would never be the same. The American public would never again view their pop culture scene quite the same way. Star Blazers had left an indelible imprint that would be remembered for generations to come, influencing scores of... Oh wait, no, that's the Beatles again. I'm sorry, what was the scene like after Star Blazers? Uh, what happened here? Well, frankly, the genericism that the original Space Cruiser Yamato was largely a reaction against never really went away. It was just sort of replaced by a different genericism. While there would be other good examples of Japanese animation, frankly, the entire industry got largely taken over with disposable product about teenage schoolgirls fighting monsters or idiot nerds having to fend off 50 dozen potential girlfriends. Yamato was an anomaly in its time, and it stayed an anomaly. While in America they did eventually break out of the paradigm of the 70s, uh, they just ran into a new one. 30 minute long toy commercials with no real characterization, no actual drama, and no continuing story. Just producers cranking out product designed to move units. And God forbid anyone should actually die or suffer real consequences. I mean, you wouldn't want to upset all those conservative PTA mobs. They wouldn't be shelling out money for the toys then. I hate boring people. Especially when they're full of boring excuses. Of course, some people did try to emulate what had been achieved with Star Blazers. They tried and failed. They tried and died. Though not as a result of anything to do with their job, of course. But this past year saw the passing of both Carl Masek and Peter Fernandez, two of the biggest figures in the history of Japanese animation being imported to America. Carl Masek, of course, gave us the series Robotech and was probably more responsible for expanding Japanese animation fandom in the United States than any other single individual, a crime for which he was never forgiven from these self-same fans. Of course he's made mistakes, but at least he does something, not like those who sit in judgment on him. Peter Fernandez, of course, gave us the infamous Speed Racer. Speed, will you please show us your pineapple? As well as the third season of Star Blazers. However, Robotech was never as faithful to its source material, and Star Blazers 3, while being less censored, was also less serious. There was a lot of electronics problems, so my orders were sent to the wrong base. But anyway, congratulations on your new appointment as permanent commander of the Argo. Hey, what's that up there? That doesn't sound so good. For whatever reason, the first two seasons of Star Blazers were one of those instances popularly referred to as catching lightning in a bottle. Just a completely unexpected event of nearly everything actually going right for a change. 
This isn't the planet bomb ravaged landscape of Earth of the Future, but the top of Stone Mountain, Georgia, where anyone actually attempting to catch lightning in a bottle for real would be met with quick and painful death. As the lightning strikes the granite so hard, it leaves these little pockmarked craters all across its surface. I mention this because, even as I record this, there's a brand new live-action Space Cruiser Yamato movie looming on the horizon just weeks away from its premiere in Japan. We'll be back! A retelling of the original Quest for Iskandar story. And I have to admit, from the trailers so far, it looks pretty awesome. Now, countless failures to deliver on these sorts of promises in the past have cautioned me against getting my hopes up, but I'll leave you with this one final thought. There is one more popular turn of phrase regarding lightning, which is the pessimistic notion that it never strikes twice in the same place. This, fortunately, is easily disprovable. So who knows? Maybe this time, we'll walk out.